Listen. Short story long. Welcome. It could take your whole life. Preach. Develop clarity. Second, patience. If it scares you, you should probably do it. Whatever you think you don't have, you have something else in its place. Mark, welcome to the pod. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited. Yes, it's going to be great. I am excited um, because, you know, I have a lot of entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs on this show and some from a lot of well-known companies, but I think the moment I first kind of saw your stuff and started reading your stuff and saw that you were a co-founder and CEO for a little bit of Netflix, it was obviously like, well, this is another level. <laughs> and, and it may not feel that way to you, but man, to me it does. And the, way, the reason I like that is because I really, like, I really live in the world of kind of these startup, you know, a lot of apparel businesses and online marketing and stuff like that. But I just feel like the things I can learn from someone who has kicked off something on that level um, are probably endless. And I'm really excited to try to get as much out of you as I can here. Well, I mean, that's kind of the, what, I mean, the book in many ways is about that untold story. Yes. Because everyone thinks it started out as this 150 million subscriber mm -hmm. streaming giant. Mm -hmm. But for years, we were just a DVD by mail company. For years, we couldn't make it work. Yeah. I mean, I, I was just telling you earlier, yep. I came into the into the building here and like, I, all of a sudden I got that vibe, like, yeah. oh my God, this is a startup. It feels like a startup. Yeah. And for many years, that's what Netflix felt like yeah and that's the part you love you love that startup energy yeah you, you know i i sometimes say that if you're really lucky you kind of figure out two things about yourself yeah like what you're good at yeah. and what you like yeah um and if you're really lucky you actually get to do both of those things yeah and i kind of figured out it's early stage companies yeah and it's not just that i like it i suck at the I mean, when companies get big yeah it's I don't know how people do that. How yeah. do you manage like a thousand people? Yeah. It's just a, it's I, a totally different game. Yeah, I'm so happy to hear you say that because like I was telling you before we started recording, I have always just sort of instinctually avoided letting my business get too corporate. I love that startup feeling. And even recently, the past few years, I've really tried to make sure that, you know, I'm covering the right bases still, the right infrastructure is in place and the right, you know, talent is where it needs to be, but I just, I don't know. There's something about it that I've never felt like I wanted to to try to get it to that place. I've walked into a lot of, uh, you know, these massive clothing companies and it just doesn't look fun anymore. So to hear you say that makes me feel really, like feels like I'm, I was right. You were my... so on the target. In fact, I'll give you the advice is don't ever um, start making things more efficient. Yeah. That is what kills companies. Really? And the temptation's gonna be there. I mean, so you're gonna go, wow, we've had this nice stability, we're growing, 90% of my orders are coming in a certain way. Yeah. And you're gonna start hiring people who are real experts at efficiency. Yeah. Because they're gonna go, we can help you cut a few points of margin, yeah. we can help you ship a little fat. They're really good at that efficiency stuff. Yeah. But the people who are really good at efficiency are clueless when all of a sudden your world changes. Yeah. And your world's gonna change, yeah. everyone's world changes. Yeah. And so what you want to do is build this culture and this environment full of people who are really adaptable, who are yeah. jacks of all trades, who are comfortable with making decisions based on incomplete and inconclusive information. Yeah. Because then when your world suddenly shifts, yeah. those are the people who can then, okay, and they yeah. shift and then on it again. Yeah, that's funny. Would you say that the main reason, we all know the story of these big corporate companies that can't pivot or make a move, would you say that's because they're built around efficiency of, of what used to work? Unquestionably. And if it's, it's a combination of things. That's what gets them into trouble. Yeah. Is they go, wow, this is nice. For years and years, we're doing the same sort of thing. We're growing nice and steadily. Yeah. We have this nice two-stage distribution where we sell to wholesalers. They sell to re and so they hire these salespeople who are really good at that. Yeah. And in the warehouse, they have people who are really good at that. And then all of a sudden, someone comes along who says, screw this multi-stage stuff. I'm going to sell straight to consumers. Oh. And they can't do it. Yeah. That's part one, is that they can't do it. But the worst part is they're scared to do it. Yeah. Because yeah. they go, I can't sell direct because my distributors, they'll kill me. Yeah. 
And right now, distributors are 95% of my business. Yeah. So you get stuck. stuck. I mean, it is, I do a lot of, I told you before, I did a lot. Of, I do some, you know, spe I do speeches sometimes. Yeah. And usually, about half the clients, I'd say, are big companies yeah. who are scared shitless at what's happening. Yeah. And the executives see it. They see it coming. And they're trying to rally people. You got to be flexible. You got to be innovative. Yeah. And so I go in and try and rally the troops, yeah. whatever you can do in an hour. So there's that piece. Yeah. And then the rest of my time, I'm working with the early startups, helping them take down these big companies. So it's this form of job security. Yeah, that's true. That is true. <laughs> you're kind of a little bit of a, yeah, either way it goes, you're set. Yeah. That's good stuff. But you do learn, what's interesting though, is the best way to learn is to be on both sides. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, that's those. amazing. Because to me now, and you had a history in clothing, we'll talk about that, but I, I see what's happening with, you know, Macy's and uh, Barney's and all of these retailers that were just staples. And, like you never thought they would ever go anywhere. And people are closing doors and going bankrupt and doing, and it's just like, at this point, this late in the game, because, you know, we've been talking about retail apocalypse for probably five or six years. I just sit there and I watch and I'm like, how are you not doing anything? How are you not, like, you know what I mean? Like, how is your, literally your ship is sinking and you're not, you know, but that makes perfect sense. It's just so deeply set up to act one way that it's so hard to pivot. Here's a classic one. Uh -huh. So take um, supermarkets, mm -hmm. okay? So for really frustrating business uh, yeah. for a consumer, yep. long lines and all, all that crap. And um, the su supermarkets have seen what's going on in e-commerce mm -hmm. and they're going, ah, that is that is not a threat. No, no way. Uh, no one can replace selling fresh vegetables and having milk and doing what we do. Yeah. And they just, and then someone looked at it and said, this is crazy having this checkout. Why can't you just go take stuff off the shelves and walk out? Yeah. And was the innovator who came up with that yeah. Safeway or Kroger? No, it was, it was Amazon. Yeah. I mean, the fact that they left that open for 20 years, that's on them, mm -hmm. you know? So let me ask you too, like, I mean, I just got right into advice part, but I, if you are one of those big guys, or you are even a, a medium or small size guy that just has your, you know, your thing figured out and you have a really good thing going, what do you do? Like, do you have a, do you have a department in the back office that's constantly trying to figure out how to disrupt your own business? Or what do you do to avoid... That happening. So, it, it's, I mean, I understand, you know, a large, uh, your audience is probably not these big companies, mm -hmm. but I'll dispense the big company advice right now. Yeah, please, yeah. The problem is you can't do it internally. Yeah. People go, I want to set up a skunk works and I'll set up a few people in an office and, yeah. and that might work temporarily, but as soon as they try and bring that out into the open, yeah. the immune system is triggered yeah. and then the white blood cells come swarming yeah. and then every department in this big company kills the startup. Yeah, so, so the true. only way to do it is to have it happen separately. And so the way you really should do it, and this is my opinion, yeah. is you basically set up a seed fund yeah. if you're a big company. You invest in lots of small startups, not so that you can own them and certainly not so you can make money, yeah. but so you have a seat at the table. Big time. And you get to see what they're working on. You get to understand the future. Yeah. Eventually you can participate in perhaps them. That's it's, true. It's really, really, really hard. Because here's what happens in my world. I have a, you know, essentially small business. And I'll give you an example of something that happened. We came up uh, using athletes and artists and all that stuff to promote our business. All of a sudden, this thing started happening that were social media influencers. And so we're like, okay, well, let's send them a bunch of clothes. And well, I don't know. Uh, let's just have them wear our clothes on YouTube. And so we did that. But one thing that happened... I will admit out from under me that I didn't spot was it became so easy to make t-shirts and so easy to start a Shopify store and so easy to start a website that now you have, I mean, there are some YouTubers doing $10 million plus a year in merch. And all of that is my business going somewhere else. And that's something I could have spotted. And I could have had 10 different uh, merch lines or these things or whatever. And, and I didn't spot it. And that's a big one where it, where it happened for me, you know what I mean? And, but, but at least you're watching it and seeing it. You're not going to catch everything. Yeah. But you're. But that was a pretty fast so spot. Fast. And I can predict what, what's going to happen next. Of course, is right now, the uh, YouTube yep. and Insta are, and are, and Facebook are going to go. Why is this schmuck making ten million yeah. bucks a year in merch yeah. on our platform? Yeah. And it's going to get taken away from them. What do they do about that though? They stop distributing things like how many likes you have. They yeah. stop uh, letting people know 
what your followership is. Yeah. I mean, they have a lot. It, it's a dance because you don't want to drive away the people who are building your building your platform. Yeah. But absolutely, yeah. um, Instagram, for example. And listen, I'm I'm speaking totally off the cuff here. I don't work yeah, at Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, as no, an I love these as an observer, yeah. uh, you know, of this. It's just not a stable environment for a company to keep on saying this is a great deal. We're we're letting the influencer make all the money. Yep. So then it goes back to obviously they want people to spend money to advertise, not get it for free. So it'll go back to the companies that are advertising on the platform. We'll get the absolutely right. So you know you can wear the shorts on the uh, on the uh, on the YouTube if you want, but the person who's going to make the money is Instagram advertising whatever they want. Yeah. Um, yeah. on the platform. It's good stuff. Or so it looks. Anyway, th but this is the, it's not so much exactly where it goes because quite frankly, as I you know, say in the book, nobody knows anything. Yeah. yeah. And I love the that. trick is going back to the very first thing we said is this, you've got to leave yourself in a position where you're flexible. Yeah. Where wherever it goes, you're not caught flat-footed and worse, caught, not, you may be caught flat-footed, but you got to be able to respond pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay, so let me get into a little <laughs> bit of, I want to understand who you are, how you got okay. here, what you do as a whole, because I know it's much more than just co-founding Netflix. Um, and then I want to get into the book. So where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Where, where, are, you, where are you from? So what was childhood like? Where's a guy like you come from? Hey, I grew up in, uh, in New York. And okay. I grew up not in the city, but not in the country. I grew kind of in the neither nor. Yeah. Um, it was kind of a really rich um, little suburb yeah. of, uh, of New York City. Yeah. But, uh, and so I had one of those, those uh, teenage alcoholic, uh, up, you know, growing up yeah. with nothing to do yeah. for the kids in high school except to drink all the time. You mean rich, like financially rich? Yeah, you, financially rich. Got it, got it. And I so mean, everyone was just drinking and- Yeah, we called ourselves, oh no, we're just like upper middle class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's, you know- That stuff. How you delude yourself when yes. you're like that. And then of course, once you, you go, I would never want to live here when I grow up. And then once all of a sudden you get out of college, you go, holy shit, I'll never be able to afford to live here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> Funny how it changes. Yeah. But you know, there's a positive to it is that- um, there's so much influence these days on TV yep. where people are equating money with happiness. Yep. You know, every commercial is like, if you buy this, you'll be happy. Yeah. And growing up in a place where people are wealthy and a lot of them are unhappy yep. um, is a great way to not have that imprint on you. Yeah, that's and true. I, I never thought about when that. When I look back at one of the biggest lessons I took from growing up there is I never really got that bug. I don't, I don't really care about money very much. Yeah, I yeah. mean, so that was kind of a really nice thing to be free of. Yeah, that's really true. But the, the big thing, I guess, is that I grew up in a family that anytime I had some crazy idea, um, my parents would encourage me to go for it. Yeah. No matter how apparently ridiculous. Yeah. Like I, like I do a lot of, I'm kind of an outdoorsy, I do a lot of alpin alpinism and yeah. backcountry skiing and surfing and anything I can do like that. But I would come home sometimes and go to my dad and go, you know, hey, I think I'm going to go caving. Uh, and this is like in middle school. Yeah. And whereas most parents are go, what are you, crazy? What are yeah. you out of your mind? Yeah. You're gonna get killed. He'd go, oh my God, that sounds so cool. And That's then you'd so take good. that path. And, yep. and That's it, so important. And it is. Yeah. But that risk taking is, since it's such a, when I look back, such a big part of where I've gone with my life, yeah. you recognize where did that come from, this comfort that, I'll figure it out. Yeah. This comfort that even though I can't quite see what's around the corner, yeah. let's go a few steps down the path and yeah. and see what it looks like. Yeah, man, I will say, I, one thing I have learned from, I didn't set out to try to gather this type of information, but what I've learned from doing 170 of these interviews is the way your parents or whoever was in charge of you at a very young age treated risk is very important. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, because it is the same, I mean, going and searching around dark caves when you're 14, it comes, it's the same thing as starting a company at 35. It's the same, oh, it you know, absolutely being able is. to deal with risk and fear and you know what I mean? But it's kind of training yourself that when you begin to feel that fear dripping, yeah. that it stimulates a pleasure center too. Yeah. It's like, it's like riding a roller coaster in that same way you go, I'm kind of scared, but I'm also kind of excited. Yeah, 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 that's right. So here's another thing for you to test it. See, you, we're going all over the place. I, I love hope, it. Hope you're cool That's what that. we do here, yeah. Yeah, so. Um, that's why I try, I don't even know why I try to give breakdown. I'm like, here's kind of where I'm thinking about going, and then no, we just go wherever. This yeah, is great. Let, let it ride. Yep. Um, so here's something for you to test since you've done these uh, so many uh, yeah. pods, you're gonna do so many more. I think the genetic marker for entrepreneurship mm -hmm. is candy arbitrage is whether mm, when right. you were like eight, yep. 
you all of a sudden made that realization that the candy bar you can buy for 10 cents at the grocery can be sold for a buck the next day at school. Big time, big time. And that's, that, so, that's so common yeah. in these conversations. Mine was yard sales. Yeah. All I ever did was try to go around my house and piece together things that maybe weren't valuable and try to make them valuable. You yeah. know, like here's a package of things. Do you want, you know what I mean? Like yeah. here's a bike tire and a wrench and a whatever. <laughs> maybe this is worth $10. <laughs> um, but yes, there's always some sort of something like that. Yeah. And such a key, like I think if you mix, someone sold candy and had this bit of fearlessness or, or not afraid of, I don't know, losing, getting in trouble, getting hurt. Exactly. Those two things could build a perfect. It is. Yeah, it, that's it, interesting, man. Do you it have is kids? Cool. What's that? Do you have kids? I have three kids, yeah. Have you like consciously tried to instill those lessons that you learned? Like, were you, uh, I guess no, because I don't, I don't have kids, like, did you kind of take, okay, this is what made me so successful and happy. How do I instill that now in, in these kids? Um, so. Yes, and as you will perhaps learn at mm -hmm. some point, you can't control much. Yeah, I mean, um, and so you kind of realize at first you can have you're gonna you can play a little baby Einstein tapes. You can kind of think <laughs> yeah. I'm creating this environment, and then pretty soon you go, this is so out of control. And especially once you have three kids, and then you've got to change from the man to man to the zone defense, yeah. and it's a totally different thing. Yeah. But what we concluded, and now, now let's segue into the whole Mark dispensing yes. parenting advice, which yeah. I have exactly three pieces of experience with. <laughs> um, the thing that we've tried to model is, do we love what we're doing? Yeah. Does mom and dad seem happy? Yeah. Does the way, do they, see, do they model us the way we treat each other, yeah. the way we act around each other? How do they see me talking about my job? Yeah. Um, and, and luckily we both do, my wife and I love each other yeah, yeah, yeah. and we treat each other with a lot of respect and we're extremely honest with each other. Yeah. And I do love what I do. And I think I want, we want those things to imprint. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's so cool. And the harder one talking about parenting is the whole, you know, I, I, I said, I do all kinds of crazy outdoor yeah. stuff and I desperately wanted my kids to be into that. Yeah. And, um, that's really hard because what most of that involves is that trade-off between how um, between pain and reward. Yeah, you've got to train someone that some of the really fun things yeah. have pain involved. Yeah, delayed gratification. Yeah. So when you're taking someone climbing a little peak for the first time, they're going, "This sucks." Yeah, like, Dad, no, I yeah, want to go play video games. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. and then all of a sudden they get to the top. Yeah. And you give them the M&Ms or whatever the hell it is. Yeah. And they're going, oh my God, this is awesome. Yeah. But that was, so in terms of pride as what I did right, yeah. I went three for three. That's so, big. And once you, you go through this, for surfing, you go through this thing where it's first you push, you're out there bobbing along and yeah. then you get the point you're pushing kids into waves. And then you're, they're surfing on their own, but you're there kind of helping them. Yeah. And then there's a moment where you go, I'm surfing with my yeah. son. Yeah. And you go, that is that is the coolest thing yeah, in the world. That has to be incredible. It's another thing that I'm so fascinated about when I look at, like I said, these interviews have kind of accidentally made me look at truly like what are all these factors that make a successful, happy person? And so obviously another place that you go in that same conversation is, well, then how do successful people raise successful children? Because that's a whole nother thing, right? Especially if you're financially successful and then there's the problem of, well, what if they don't know struggle? What if they blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And so I'm fascinated by hearing how successful people have instilled that in their children. Yeah. You know? it, it's, a, it's a really interesting thing. Like, for example, so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll jump, I'll jump ahead kind of the end of the story, yeah. but, you know, the Netflix is really, my, that will never work is kind of this Netflix zero to one. Yep. It's from where the idea came from and it walks all the way through and it kind of ends at the IPO. Yep. And I left about a year or so after the IPO. Got it. And when I left Netflix, I wasn't sure I had it in me to start another company. Because mm -hmm. Netflix was number six. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I was not sure that I wanted to go full time. And I took about a year of where I said, I'm not, I'm not retired. Yeah. I'm just taking some time to figure things out. Yeah. And a lot of my friends from my, who knew me and who had also have kids go, aren't you like scared of not working? Yeah. Like 
do you want your do you want your kids to see you not working yeah. or something like that? Yeah. And I it, it never occurred to me. I, I go no, they saw me completely alive yeah. when I was working. Yeah. The thing that I imprinted on them was not work is this thing you trudge off to do and you come home and you immediately need the martini and yeah, yeah, and yeah. you just bitch about your boss. Yeah. For me, it was the op, and the, and and it's been true. They have this. Inc- kids have this work ethic, and I again, I have no idea how much of it was me. Yeah, but they have the work ethic, and I think it comes from them associating solving a cool problem is the, which I believe yeah. solving interesting problems is what life is all about. Yeah, it's fascinating. Okay, so how right. do you get from <laughs> <So> anyway? <laughs> that's amazing. How do you get from that that sort of upbringing to into Starting companies and into doing more than just flipping candy bars. So here's the ran, here's the random shit story. Okay, yeah, you, please. You, ne- you never know. Yes. So first of all, I was a I was a major. I majored in geology. Wow. Which of course that's the obvious thing that you would major yeah, in. If clearly, you were start that's a, what I would have guessed. Yeah. A company later. Well, did but, you have at that time a different passion? Maybe you thought you were gonna. No, I loved being out in the mountains. And all of a sudden, I'm looking around and going, guys, see the geology majors. They're all hopping in a van every Thursday, and they're yeah. going off for this three day field trip. Yeah. S- sign me up that school sign yeah. me up for that yeah. get the trapes around in the glaciers and the pe- <laughs> picking at rocks it was, it was cool yeah um, but anyway so when I graduated I didn't have any particular I wasn't like pre-law or pre-med or something like that yeah and um, I, I drifted around a little bit and then I ended up getting this job as a gopher um, I was kind of the you might you might call him chief of staff for a CEO of a company, but that would grossly overinflate what I really did. Yes. What I did was this guy was a music it was a music publishing company. Yeah, got it. And um, so they had all these divisions, and my job was to follow this guy around with a pad. And when he would have a meeting, and he go, "Yes, I'll deliver you those reports on Wednesday." I go, make sure you get the reports from Joe on Wednesday. Yeah. And when the CEO would say, I'll get right back to you with uh, our commitment on that, I said, remind him to get back with the commitment on that. Yeah, yeah. But doing this, I saw what a CEO did all day. I saw how he treated his employees, how he treated his partners. Yeah. Um, I saw the learn the different divisions of a business. So it was just kind of this really interesting grounding. Yeah. But then the other lucky break was one of the divisions, again, overstatement, was a mail order division. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the mail order division was essentially in the back of these sheet music books. Uh Because it was like, you know, John Denver for Auto Harp or Led Zeppelin for Tuba. Like weird sheet music books. And in the back, they'd have this little tag that said, for a list of more great Cherry Lane songbooks, send a self-addressed stamped envelope. Mm -hmm. And then my job, running the mail order division, was taking these self-addressed stamped envelopes, making a copy of the list of more great Cherry Lane songbooks uh-huh. and mailing it out. Yep. And when the order came in, I go to the warehouse and pick it and ship it. Wow. And for some reason, oh my God, that's the coolest thing in the world. You loved it. Loved it. Because I began experimenting. Yeah. And I go, what happens if I do color list of more great or a picture? Yeah. Or what happens if I do a folded brochure? Or maybe we should do a little catalog. Or what happens if we run full page ads in the songbooks rather than just the... Yeah, and little by little began building this thing up, teaching myself direct response marketing, yep. teaching myself fulfillment, teaching myself all the all the phone stuff. I mean, yeah. But given this, it was given this opportunity to run with the support of a bigger company. Yeah, but on my own. Yeah. What age was that roughly? That was twenty three. Yeah, I just think one of those most important things, and. It, some people, it seems like for some reason, never you figure were it out. Right when you started, twenty-two. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, some people never really figure this out, but being able to learn and see the payoff of your adjustments. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah, so yeah. important. Just that simple lesson. Like, if I do this better, do I get a better reward? And learning that young, I think, is so important. Because I've met Absolutely. six-year-olds that still don't think it works that way. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's still kind of just like, I just do what I'm told and it never works out. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, it's the beauty of direct response marketing, too, yeah. is it's designed to send something out and see what happens. Yeah. And you test it. Yeah. And I, 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 so I, I'll jump forward because I want to tie this right back. Yeah, yeah. But then I, I you know, I, I well, I jump forward. I was doing direct marketing for a software company. Yeah. And years later, and I used to blow the engineers, the programmers' minds. Yeah. Because I'd go, no, you know, the uh, the blue envelope actually sells 
about 10% better than the red envelope. Yeah. And they go, ah, that's a bunch of bullshit. How, yeah. how, who, how could that, the color of the envelope possibly yeah. impact someone's decision to buy the software? That's all going to be about the features. And, yeah. and I go, no, let me show you. And I'd show them the data. And you could see their minds like exploding because yeah. they're going, it makes no sense, but the data makes sense. It makes no sense. <laughs> and, and then, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so I did direct marketing. So I um, did that for a bunch of years, uh, about a year and a half. And then this company decided to start a magazine, uh -huh. um, a guitar magazine. Um, they had all the editorial people. Um, and then they're all looking around the room going, we need someone to do circulation. And it was like, you know, everyone wants to do circulation, take one step forward and one steps back. <laughs> yeah. And so I had to teach myself magazine circulation, which is subscriptions. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I went, uh, and then I got recruited to turn around a mail order company in uh, Carmel, California, which yeah. got me to the West Coast. Yeah. Then I ended up working at a software company. So I had these, these startups that were within... We started, you know, a jump missed stage. We started a magazine called yeah. Mac User Magazine. We started a mail order company called Mac Warehouse, yeah. Micro Warehouse. But I came out 20 years later. I was in my mid 30s. I was a junk mail king, uh -huh. but I knew a ton about subscriptions. I knew a ton about using the post office. Yeah. I knew a ton about personalization. Yeah. You might see where some of this is yeah, going. Absolutely. This is, I mean, <laughs> And can I ask you this? Why do you think? Do you think that it was that moment where you said it all kind of clicked that made you? What made you so hungry to keep trying completely different stuff? Oh God, that's that I don't know. Yeah, uh, you have to ask Doctor Uncle Siggy. Yeah, my uh, uh, what? Where that comes from? Yeah, it's, it's just, just funny that you would think like, well, you know what? I'm. It's time to go to college. I like the thing where you can hang out on the mountain. I'm going to study that. And then somehow, you know, five years, six years later, you're like, oh, let me try this. Let me try that. Let me try. You know what I mean? That's crazy. Because one of the questions that a lot of people ask me, and I think a lot of young people ask, there's kind of this new feeling that college is obviously failing a lot of people, meaning it's not giving them, you have a crap ton of debt and you're not, you don't leave with a real purpose. And everyone's looking for a purpose. Everyone's looking for a degree, no debt and a purpose at the end of college, I think. The question is always, how do I find my purpose? How do I find my passion? How do I find my thing? What's your... <sighs> so that, that's a great, great thing to bring up because I so am on the other side of that. Really? I go, chill out. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And my son, I mean, my kids all read my book. Mm -hmm. And my son, and he gave me all kinds of editorial comments. And my son goes, God, I really want you to tell the whole geology and the whole... Icon, all these other companies that you work for, and this yeah. meandering path, yeah. because because there's so much pressure on us yeah. to like know what we want to do, yeah. and uh, or this pressure from our parents that we, we we took economics, we have to get a job at Goldman Sachs, yeah. or we got to get be the lawyer, or the predictable, yeah. and they're going, I wish they could just read what you did, that it took you, you know, until you were you know almost in your late twenties before you. It's, it clicked yeah. before you found this thing that was the puzzle yeah. that you spent the rest of your life. And solving's the wrong word, but yeah. the process. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah I, that's great. Yeah, I, 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 I'm a big believer in liberal arts education rather than university education because yeah. I think that the the skills that you might come out of now if you take vocational, yeah. if you pick the right vocation, yeah, maybe the last twenty years. Yeah. But God, so many of the vocations that you're learning now are not going to be applicable. Yeah. Whereas learning how to speak, learning how to make and defend an argument, learning how to detect bullshit, yeah. I mean, those never go. Being able to public speak, yeah. I use that stuff every day yeah. Yeah. and have for the last 40 years. Yeah. That's fascinating. <laughs> right. um, anyway, the Mark Randolph story. So we got to get to yeah. So then we're at the end, late twenties. Run out of time. Here. <laughs> so at the end of twenties, your things start to what, what happens? How do how do we get to Netflix? So anyway, I, I, you know, I, I, it's this long period of of, um, of direct marketing, really. And then I was in the software business for a long time, which got me into tech. Yeah. Um, and also got me into general management. So I had all this background, and I'd started a lot of companies in here. Yeah. So they were mail order companies, but there was that same process of I have no idea how I'm going to solve this problem. I was given a chance to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. So one of the companies that I helped start was acquired. Great thing. Yeah. And great thing economically. Yeah. But the other great thing was I met the person who acquired us was a guy named Reed Hastings. Mm -hmm. 
And the big lucky break was not only did I get to go work for him directly, yeah. we lived in the same town Got it. and began commuting back and forth to work. Got it. And what was his company at the time? It was called Pure Atria. What did they do? They did memory leak detection, yeah. which I'm sure you're a big customer of. Uh, Huge. I mean, one of my favorites, really. <laughs> I would say second to Netflix is memory leak detection. Well, it, it was very... <laughs> It was very nice when I did Netflix to finally have a company I could actually describe to my parents yeah. what the hell it did. Big time. But that's time. the problem in tech. Yeah. And, but I got dragged in. I, I started off like doing gentle tech. And then yeah. it got, as these, com one company got acquired, then another company got acquired. You get sucked into these things and you go, what am I doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But luckily, Reed's company also got acquired. Yeah. Ah, so and that freed the, him up. Freed both of us up. We both got fired. So can I ask you this, because this is the moment that to me seems like a movie moment, uh, maybe uh, to you, I'm sure it doesn't, but on these long, did you guys conceptualize Netflix on these long car rides? Yes. And does it just, you guys are just shooting the shit and you're like, hey, what, what if we did this? What if we did that? And what if, and it just, you're like, hey, let's give this a try. Well, I mean, Reed, when, when we knew we were both losing their jobs, I said, I'm going to start another company. Yeah. Reed was going to go, I'm going to go change the world and I need, I'm going to do it in education and I'm going to go back to Stanford, get my wow. higher degree in education, yeah. get some credibility. Yeah. But he goes, you know, once you're an entrepreneur, you're always an entrepreneur. So he goes, uh, let's, do, let's, let's do this. I will be your angel investor. Yeah. I'll put the money in, we'll do an idea together, mm -hmm. and then you start it and run it, and we'll both get what we want. Yeah. We needed the idea. And, um, and, in, and that will never work. We're we talk about these car rides where we just brainstorm ideas yeah. and all kinds of shit. Yeah. I mean, Netflix could have been uh, customized baseball bats yeah. because my dad was a machinist and he was playing with these computer-controlled milling machines. Yeah. Uh, could have been personalized shampoo. I mean, these are all ideas that I pitched to Reed yeah. on this commute. Yeah. And when you like pitch them, he shuts them down, you guys go back and forth. Okay, next one. Yeah. I'll talk to you tomorrow on the car ride. And in fact, one of the ones he shut down early was video rental by mail mm -hmm. because back then it was VHS cassettes. Yep. Yep. But then about a month later, all of a sudden... Um, we hear about this new technology being test marketed called the DVD. Yeah, yeah. And we're in the car going, well, wait, it's about the size of a CD and it's thin and it's light and the light bulb goes off. Yeah. And we go, we could probably do this for 29 cents. Yeah. And so, but then this is the classic entrepreneurial moment. Rather than going, let's think about this some and let's do a business plan. We go, let's just start by examining the very basics of this premise. Can you really mail a disc without it breaking? Yeah. So we just turned the car around right in the middle of the commute, went down to Santa Cruz, yeah. where we lived. Um, we went into a music store and bought a used Patsy Cline music CD. Yeah. And then went a couple of doors down and bought a little pink gift envelope, like you'd put a yeah. greeting card in and put the disc in and addressed it to Reed's house in Santa Cruz and bought the stamp and mailed it yeah. and then went to work. And then the next morning when, we, uh, came, when he came to pick me up, just held it up, unbroken, 29 cents, less than a day. That Patsy that Klein the, CD doesn't exist still, does it? What? That Patsy Klein Oh God, I wish it that'd did. That'd be incredible. Yeah. And that was it. That was like, okay. Yep. That, that was, that That's was the movie the, moment. That was the movie moment. Yep. That was the, aha. Uh -huh. But people, we all want that um, moment of divine inspiration where it all becomes clear. Yeah. yeah. You know, the Newton... With the Apple or the Archimedes in the bathtub or yeah. even the Airbnb mattress. You, you want this moment where the whole thing springs. And of course, it's not like that. Yeah. Yeah. Once you go this, you go, how, how is this going to work? Yeah. And lots of time. And then once we finally got to the point, we go, well, I guess we should figure it out. We should try it. Back then, you couldn't just dial up an instance on Amazon Web Services. And yeah. Yeah. You had to build, build it. Yeah. And so we then spent, Reed wrote the check for $1.9 million, which I trotted down to the Wells Fargo and handed to the teller, <laughs> expecting to get ushered into the back room, you know, yeah. for champagne or at least a toaster. Yep. You know, Nothing. no. <laughs> just you give want, you a thank you. You want change with that? <laughs> um, <laughs> want cash back? Yeah, jeez. Um, and, and then we spent six months and on April 14th, 1998, a little bit more than 20 years ago, uh, off we went. Gosh. Yeah. So... There's the quick fast forward, but that, you know, that was just the beginning. Yeah. It, it was just DVD, it was DVDs by mail, that little red envelope. I don't know whether you uh, ever remembered seeing that, but. I remember we, seeing it, I, but I started as a member streaming, with yeah. the streaming. Yeah. yeah, but we just mailed our five billionth disc. 
So people are we we mailed a sh yeah. shit ton yeah. metric shit ton yeah. Yeah. of uh, of discs. Yeah, and that's that is what the initial idea was because at the time, even though we knew streaming was going to happen, yeah, um, at the time you couldn't have done it. There just wasn't the bandwidth. The bandwidth was hooked up to your desktop, not yeah. to your TV, and the studios wouldn't have dealt with us. So was the way that it felt like to you guys was it that you knew streaming was coming? So you'll kind of explore that as it, to me that almost sounds like you guys disrupted Blockbuster and then you disrupted yourselves. You know what I mean? Which Absolutely. that's exactly what I was talking about where like, did you know, ah, did you know streaming was coming? And so you were ready when that disruption, when, when, the, when it could be handled? Yes, um, smartest thing we ever did, which was if we had at the beginning positioned the company as, this is the Netflix, the world's fastest shipper of plastic. Mm -hmm. We probably could have crushed it until all of a sudden everyone's streaming DVDs and yeah. then no one cares about plastic. But if we had on day one said, Netflix, the place to go for streaming or downloading movies, yeah. we would have failed because it ultimately took 10 years before yeah. streaming came along. Yeah. So instead, we positioned ourselves as Netflix, the place to find entertainment you love, yeah. which is delivery agnostic and, yeah. and it works on plastic, it works streaming, it'll work when someone figures out how to beam it into your fillings or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, it, it allowed us to straddle that disruption yeah. and allowed us to build this base of customers and goodwill, which we could carry with us when that disruption happened. Yeah. And that is what allowed us to come, when all of a sudden Blockbuster and HBO, you know, Everyone was flirting with the downloading streaming. We came barreling into it with yeah. 35 million customers. Yeah, gosh. That's, I will say you're the first person that I've ever sat and talked with that, you know, there's countless books and articles and all this stuff about like if Blockbuster's mission statement would have been that, then maybe they would have done it. But instead it was, you know, whatever, how to figure out how to rent videos better. And so there's always like- Manage dissatisfaction. You're right, right. <laughs> and like, so it just, you know, I've, I've seen so many things about really making sure that your mission is proper and that however it gets there is how it gets there. But the, the goal is, is right. And I will say, I think you're the first person, at, at least on that level that I've talked to that has truly done that. Like started a company so clear on what your actual, actual goal is, even if your means of distribution changes. Right. It's fascinating. I mean, and, and that's why you guys, that's yeah, why it is where it is. It was. It was incredibly, I mean, I, you could say smart, mm -hmm. but you could also say lucky. Yeah. Um, but we- it's always a little of both. It's a little of both. Yeah. And because there's been other companies that I've even been tangentially involved with, which I fought to get them to recognize that they had to prepare for the ultimate disruption. Yeah. There was a, a book, a company called Book Renter, which was renting college textbooks. Yeah. And I was going, I've, I've seen this movie. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you cannot be about renting books. You've got to start the transition yeah. of changing what your brand stands for. Yeah. Anyway, really, yeah. really hard. Yeah. But that's the skill of an entrepreneur. Is, and, and with your company, with any company, is that the best ones pick something which is concrete now. Yeah. And it's small and focused and deliberate. And if you get it right, yeah. it sets you up for the next real, next uh, adjoining space, yep. which if you get that right, it sets you up for the next adjoining space. Yep. But if you try and jump ahead and try and address the space before you're ready, yeah. you're gonna get crushed. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a really interesting, intuitive guess. And yeah. you, can, you can need to be lucky, because you may execute perfectly, and you're on the fourth adjoining space, yeah. and then something happens. Yeah. Google comes in, yeah. and then you go, oh. Yeah, it's such a tricky game, <laughs> isn't it? But it's it's the game, not the not the outcome. Yes, I mean, and I got I. It's so trite, but in, but in in that will never work if nothing comes away from what pe from people take from reading this crazy story of going from a Patsy Klein CD and a first class stamp to to an IPO. Yeah, it is that you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. And so you cannot bank everything on success. You have to bank it on the fun of assembling this crew of great, smart, crazy people yeah. and trying to change the world. Yeah, so true. And then so when you, uh, so then Reed took over as CEO, that was right after the IPO you said? No, it was before, he took over as CEO before. Oh, got it. It was a, and that was a, boy, that was a dramatic, really tough moment. There was one, 
one evening, and I was working late in the office. This is probably a year and a half in or something like that. Yep. And Reed walks in and goes, we need to talk. And, and I was going, oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, one, know, of yeah. those, like, one of those we one need of, to talk. One of those, like yeah. your dad goes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Christopher or whatever you <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> or whatever That's your middle exactly name is, it. you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're going, oh, fuck. Uh -huh. um, and he goes, um, frankly, I'm worried. And then begins running me through a PowerPoint slideshow of like uh, all the <laughs> missteps he thought I was making. Uh -huh. And I'm going, no, listen, I am not going to let you tell me I suck yeah. in a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the point is, though, um, he went through this and it was painful, mm -hmm. but he was right mm -hmm. in that I was making missteps at a reasonably small size. Yeah. And what he was proposing was not that I kick me out. Yeah. He's going, we should run this together yeah. as a team. Yeah. And he goes, we'll be infinitely stronger as a team. We'll be more likely to be successful as a team. But it, it sent me home that night with this really interesting thing to think about, which was I had had this dream of being the CEO of my own company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I now had to realize those were really two dreams, that I could either have the company be a success yeah. or it could be me as the CEO, yeah. and that they may not both happen if I insisted on them both happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I ultimately realized that it wasn't my dream anymore. It was everyone's dream. Yeah. It was the people who worked there who were putting in the nights and the weekends. Yeah. It was the people who had put money in, yeah. my mom, yeah. um, that I owed take, doing everything I could to ensure the company was successful. Yeah. It was to the customers. Yeah. And ultimately decided that I would rather share running the company. And having yeah. Reed came in as CEO and I stayed as, as president. Yeah. Um, and uh, then stick to this ego thing, it has to be me. Yeah, what an incredible moment of no ego. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Because I could see how it gets, you know, this thing's working. This idea of yours is really working. You're CEO and you're like, no, I want the glory to take this thing all the way to, you know what I mean? And so Absolutely. to have that, that whatever, that, that vision of it is, is incredible. A and to still be involved and to still, like, would you say Reed is more, he just enjoys more like this massive, trying to run this massive thing than you do, or? So there's two, two things that, um, one is he is unbelievably good. Uh -huh. I mean, there's a handful of people, literally probably one handful of people who are phenomenal early stage entrepreneurs yeah. and yeah. phenomenal late stage. And yep. you, you put in a Steve Jobs or a Jeff Bezos yep. or a Elon Musk maybe, yeah. yeah. But, but Reed Hastings is in that yeah. category, yeah. and I'm not. Yeah. I'm, I, I'll put myself in the top 98 percentile of yeah. early stage. Reed's yeah. in the 99.99 percentile. Yeah, that's incredible. So there's that. Yep. He's extremely talented, and the things he's really talented at demonstrate themselves. Yep. Yep. Um, and now pardon me for not remembering whether we talked about this before we yeah, started or once we started, yeah. but you know, if you're really lucky as you're uh, as an adult, you learn what you're good at and what you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. did say that. Yeah, you did. And, was, uh, yeah. Worth repeating. And this, yeah. <laughs> you know? And I go, I love the early stage stuff, yeah. but I'm not very good at the late stage stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And Reed is phenomenal. So it was really, I'm not saying this was easy, yeah. and it took some adjustment, but in retrospect, once we were running it together, that is the period where all the, that was the Beatles, um, yeah. Sergeant Pepper, moment yeah that was um that found the right balance that was the, the lennon and mccartney yeah that's when we had the incredible technical innovation from reed paired with deeply emotive um customer sensitivity yeah. th initiatives coming from me yeah and the combination of those two things created the cinematch which was the personalization algorithm yeah. it created finally finding the new breakthrough model that can stopped us from being this struggling flailing startup to one that had a repeatable scalable model yeah huge yeah it was it was pretty cool okay so that leads me to that's a perfect lead to the book right because what i love is i really love the fact that because once again i can't reiterate enough how difficult that must have been to have that moment with all this success realize start to get clear on what you love loving the startup portion of it loving, and then going and doing that 
And so you said you've been working with, did you go, so you took a year off, you said, and then did you start after that? That's when you started working with startups and, and yeah. helping people do what you do best? I realized that I had two competing things here. I, I really love that problem solving of startups and you can't walk away from that. Yeah. I mean, I often say that, you know, if you're a true entrepreneur, it's like walking past a puppy in a box on the sidewalk. Yeah. Yeah. You have to go, Who, whose is this? Or, <laughs> yeah. And if you can't find the owner, you have to take it home and you just can't help it. Yep. I mean, you can't turn that off. Yep. But at the same time, I was now in my mid to late 40s yep. um, and my kids were all in elementary, you know, middle school. Yep. Um, and I go, I, I kind of would like to not be working seven days a week uh, yeah. all that time anymore. Yep. So I found... I, I took a long time, took a couple of years. I built a model for myself, which gave me what I wanted, yep. which was, it's right now it's mentoring early stage entrepreneurs. I work with founding teams. Amazing. And it gives me the rush of being part of starting a company. Yeah. I get to come in and sit around the table with really smart people yeah. solving really interesting problems. Yep. But then I get to get up at five o'clock and go home, whereas they are the ones now who spend all night executing. Yeah. And... And I've, not only has that been so emotionally gratifying to do it, I've learned so much mm -hmm. from, you know, Netflix was one big seven year, whatever it was, six year thing. But this is seeing it over and over and over again. Yeah. And you begin to learn these patterns. And in that will never work. I'm talking, about, I'm telling the stories of Netflix. I'm telling about the mailing out the porno DVD. I don't yeah. know if you saw that. Yeah. I'm telling about these people stealing from us, the firing people, the whole kit and caboodle, yeah. but embedded in it are these lessons that I've learned are universal. And not just for starting a company, yeah. but for anyone who has like this crazy idea yeah. that everyone is saying that'll never work yeah. and that they want to figure out how do I make this yeah. real. It's so cool. I, number one, you couldn't be at a better time because we live in a time where entrepreneurship is cooler than ever <laughs> and everyone wants to start a thing and they have their Instagram page. And like I said, they probably have their Shopify store or their Amazon drop shipping and they got whatever. And I just think someone like you that has such big experience and then has worked with so many people in this space, like this advice, there's the problem is when something becomes popular, there's also a lot of people that don't really know what they're talking about in the space, writing books and doing podcasts and stuff like that. So to have someone like you sort of, giving these lessons and telling this stuff, I think is really important and really valuable. Um, so the book is called That Will Never Work, an incredible title. Yeah, thank you. And the one thing that I just want to get right into, because you keep mentioning it and I loved it when I saw it, was essentially that no one knows what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say a, a, a story of mine oh, is good. I always, for a very long time, and I still try to, I still catch myself sometimes, felt like everyone else did know what they were doing, just I didn't. <laughs> and I felt like, man, you know, I didn't, I, I like to sit here and say, I didn't go to business school, I didn't go to blah, 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 but I always kind of felt like, yeah, but that probably means, I'm, you know what I mean? Everyone There's else knows some class something, yeah. And so I think hearing that from people like you is so amazing. I think it's so important for young people to hear that early yeah. and know that, okay, if I can start with knowing that nobody knows what they're doing and approach it that way, I cannot ever have that insecurity or that thing in the back of my mind. But can you expand on that a little bit? Completely. First of all, I completely agree. No one knows anything. I love I mean, that. No one can tell in advance if it's a good idea or a bad idea. So anyone who listens to your idea and goes, that will never work, yep. call bullshit on them. Yep. They do not know. There's only one way to figure out whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, and that is to try it yep. or do it or yep. test it or build something or make something. You have to do that. Um, the other important thing is... This issue of like, this person's better at it than I, or they know something than I do. Yeah. It is so untrue. Yeah. Um, probably the most important lesson to take away from listening to me blather on for an hour or whatever is that I am no smarter than anybody who's listening now. I'm not. They're smarter than I am probably. They're certainly probably harder working. Uh -huh. They're almost unquestionably better prepared uh -huh. um, than I was. So and why are you so much more successful? Because I actually did something about yeah. it. I didn't sit and build this castle in my mind that four years later someone else does and I go, oh, I had that idea. Yeah, yeah well, this guy had the idea and he did something about it. Yeah. There's a, a guy named Nolan Bushnell who's um, was founder of Atari. Yeah. 
Um, and he has, he has this quote that, I'll try and remember it from memory, I'm not that kind of quote, whip them off. Yeah. But he said something like, everybody who has taken a shower has had an idea. <laughs> yes. But it is the person who gets out of the shower, towels off and does something about it that makes a difference. Yeah. And that is the key, is yeah. that it's not easy. It's really easy for me to say, just do it. It's really hard because what you have to have this skill is to figure out the quick, simple, easy way to test your idea yeah. without actually doing it. Yeah. And for, you, do we have time for a little quick quick story? Everything, yeah. I, if okay. you're okay on time, we can go a little over. I'm cool. Okay. okay. Um, this is fun. Yeah, I love it. Um, uh, so we, we, were, we were flailing um, and we were basically doing what we had to do. And at the beginning, the company took off. Yeah. We had a $100,000 month, but it was all selling DVDs. Yeah. And that was death because Amazon was about to enter and we knew we'd be out of business. Yeah. And so we go, oh crap. And what was worse is that doing both selling and renting at the same time was impossible. Too complicated, we're confusing customers, titles were some you could rent, some you could buy. So we had to have this courage moment where we said we're gonna walk away from um, selling DVDs. Yeah. And one moment, turn the switch, 99% of our revenue is gone and we've gotta figure this out. So we did that, so that's big courage moment. Yeah. But here's the story, is that now we're desperate and we have all these ideas, we begin testing these ideas. And I'm this perfectionist at the time, so I'm making these beautiful tests. Yeah. You know, custom photography and arguing over every l line of copy and stress testing the site and every link. And then it would take us probably three weeks to build a test, yeah. and then it wouldn't work. Yeah. And we go, we just wasted three weeks. Mm -hmm. So we go, okay, faster. So we do a test in two weeks and fail. And go, ah, a week. And then a test every day. And then we're doing two or three tests a day. And as you probably can guess, yeah. things are getting pretty shitty. Yeah. You know, broken links and the wrong photos of the watermark is in or misspellings yeah. and we're yeah. crashing the site. Yeah. And didn't make a difference. Yeah. Because if it was a bad idea that no matter how beautifully this test we had put together was, yeah. still wasn't a good idea. Yeah. But if it was a good idea, then even the crappiest piece of crap, yeah. customers immediately would raise their hand and go, this, yeah. this is what I like. Yeah. They knew what to fix. And the insight was that it wasn't about having a good idea. It was about building the system and this culture to test lots and lots of bad ideas. Yeah. And that is the key to just do it. Yeah. Is don't get caught up in this perfect thing. Do, don't get, don't, you don't need to test everything. Try something and fail at it. Yeah. Because the failure is the learning moment. Yeah. And it's one learning moment sequentially after another, that is the difference between someone like myself and the person who has the idea and just begins embellishing it in their mind, yeah. adding, you know, they start with the simple house and then all of a sudden they got the wing and the second story and the turrets and the gargoyles. Yeah. And then of course your castle, it's a castle, it's gonna cost millions. Of, and then they're going, I can't do my idea because I've got to raise, yeah. how do I raise $2 million? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Or how do I hire 30 people? Yeah. And they go, you're, knock that shit down and just, do something. Yeah. That's why I also think perfectionism is so dangerous because it's, I've heard so many people say, oh, well, I'm a perfectionist. As if it's like, oh, so you, you're special. <laughs> you know, like everything you put out is gold. And it's like, man, I think 99% of the time, if not 100, it's a way to avoid taking risks. And it or seems go, like- the, Oh, so you're a dick to work for. Yeah, or that, <laughs> or you, man. And, and I think that like, you know, the game, I've learned so many times now, the game is how do you take as many risks as, as you can handle to be able to find the thing, not to never take them, or not to take one shot a year, but you feel like it's perfect. The, it's a quantity, it's a dart throwing more game than, but I've just, I feel like so many people are trapped in the, they label themselves perfectionists as if it's uh, something to be proud of. In fact, the, my advice, I've never actually given it this way, is be an imperfectionist. Yeah, 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 <laughs> big time. What's the key? Be an imperfectionist. Yes. It's fascinating, man. I think that I'm like- steal that from you. Yeah, take it. I mean, you, I, just, I just dug it out. Because um, I think that if you really look at your story, you can see this personality trait 
runs all the way along. Meaning to me, going and taking a job, you know, uh, first going for uh, geology, yeah. then going and taking this job, then in the mailing, figuring that yeah. out. Then you never took yourself too seriously, it doesn't sound like. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, back to my question of how do you find your purpose, I think there's 16 year olds out there that wanna just put their flag in the ground and say, I am this and I wanna be the best this. And it's like they're afraid to even be maybe fired from a job or maybe not good at something. Or It seems like that's just something I'm really grabbing onto is your whole story has been about trying stuff and seeing what works and not taking anything too seriously. That's serious. right, I, I haven't really thought about it that way, yeah. but you're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm jealous sometimes, you know, my kids had friends like in even elementary school and you know, the kid goes, I wanna be a vet. And God bless them, all the way through high school, they're going, oh, I really wanna be a vet. And they call it, I wanna be a vet. And I go, wow, yeah. that is so cool. Yeah. That person knew what they wanted to do yeah. when they were like eight yeah. and it stuck. But uh, boy, I sure as hell wasn't me. Yeah. Uh, and it's not most people. And I, that's why I was reacting like going, just chill. Yeah. It'll yeah, come. Right. It will come. If you take some risks, if you try a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, and once again, it's fascinating to me how that same lesson, the same lesson that applies when you're starting a business tomorrow, applies when you're at Netflix and you're already very successful, and, but you just need to try a new you know, website layout or whatever. It's the yeah. same thing. We, you know... You, people might, you, are you smart? You know, no, I am like, almost all of my ideas were bad ones, uh -huh. but I tried a whole ton of bad ones. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, the sequential learning that came from all those bad ideas eventually meanders its way into something that yeah. works. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cool story. I mean, uh, uh, it's non-intuitive, it's lots and lots of false starts. That's a happy ending. It sure does, man. Mm -hmm. What? Um, how many people would you say you, how many small businesses or, or startups do you work with now? Uh, four. Yep. I can really, my model is, I used to do something, I used to be an advisor, mm -hmm. which is the most, the worst word in the world. Yep. Because if you come in and you do this pattern recognition thing yep. and you dispense some advice, then you leave. And it's completely unsatisfactory to the person who asked the advice and completely unfulfilling to you and you, so I go, that, when, I was, when I was looking at models, I abandoned that. Yeah. I go, I've got to be deeply enough immersed. I've got to understand the product and the market and the competitors and the employees. But mostly, I've really got to understand the founding people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, to invest that amount of time, you can't do very many. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do three to, two to four is probably about what the right number is. Yeah. And some of them, when they work, then they go on for a long time. Yeah. Some when they don't work, they're, they're shorter, so you're constantly, yeah, uh, you're constantly ju juggling it. But it's um, the other weird thing about this mentoring thing to, to ramble on again. No, no, please. Is um, it's not advice about go to market and about technology. It's mostly marriage counseling. Yeah, that's that, what I would imagine. I was yeah, I was gonna kind of ask you that. I mean, you're, are you you're a sole are you a sole founder or do you have a partner? I have a partner. Yeah, yeah. That's a critical thing for stability and lack of loneliness and, and you have twice the bandwidth which gives you like three times the power yep. but you spend more time with that person than you will eventually with your spouse yep. and uh, there's conflicts and so a lot of it is how do you work these things out yeah. and then also when companies get a bit bigger they'll have how do you deal with your senior employees how do you deal with your board um, yeah. and so much and how do you keep your marriage alive? Yeah. How do you, or if you're not even at that point, how do you keep yourself healthy? Yeah. How do you keep your relationships? How do you keep yourself as a whole person? Yeah. Those are the, th people learn the technology and the marketing yeah. in school or on listening to uh, you know pods like yours and yeah. reading, yeah. but they don't learn that other stuff. Yeah. And that, because that requires a deep understanding of the real problem. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, has, it has fascinated me continuously as I grow in business, how much of it comes back to, you know, how to deal with people, how to deal with relationships, how to, how to just be a good person. I mean, at the end of the day, like the more you know yourself, the more you know how to deal with people, the better leader you'll be, the better, you know what I mean? And it's entirely that. Yeah, I mean, we don't it, talk about that. I think a lot of young people think like, well, no, I'm just going to be like one of those asshole leaders that just gets what I want. And I'm gonna be like, no, do it now. You know, like people kind of envision the the boss as that guy. Yeah. And man, it is not. That's not the game. 
it's you know at Netflix they the role of the manager is extremely simple. Mm-hmm. It's make sure you have the right people in the right slots and make sure they have the information they need to do self-directed work. Yeah. You do not tell them what to do. Yeah. You do not tell them how to do it. Yeah. You say here's the objective and let them figure it out. And here's I'll give you a quick a quick Please, example. Yeah. This happened. This is with me because this is something I'm dealing with right now. Just so you know, just being very uh, transparent on the pod here is I'm truly making that transition in my life from feeling, you know, I would have talented people and I would uh, uh, proud of the people I had with me, but really rounding that corner to like just put the right person in place, let them do what they do. It's scary at it's first. It's very scary and very hard. Yeah. But this this one engineer um, came to me. And he goes, ah, I met somebody. And I go, that's awesome. And he goes, but she lives in San Diego. And he goes, so here's what I'd like to propose. Um, I'd like to leave work about noon on Fridays and I'll fly down to San Diego. Yeah. And then um, when I'll, I'll you know, work Friday afternoon, evening, and then I'll be in the, over the weekend and I'll work Monday and fly home Monday night and be off Tuesday morning. Yeah. Would that be cool with you? Yeah. And I said, wait a sec. So if you're asking me if it's okay to work from San Diego, because I could care less. You could work from Mars for all I care. Yeah. Bottom of the ocean, yeah. I'm all in. <laughs> yeah. But if what you're asking me is, am I willing to lower my expectations of what you're supposed to accomplish? Yeah. Then that's an easy answer too. The answer is no. Yeah. So if you are smart enough to be able to manage a team on three and a half days in the office, I am jealous. Yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. But if you can, fantastic. And what of ended course, up happening? Made the, the girlfriend wasn't very happy. Uh-huh. Made the decision, of course, I can't do that. Yes. And the That's point so is, good. though, that when you're managing people, that what they really want is not beanbag chairs and fireman poles and kombucha yeah. on tap and all yeah. that crap. Yeah. What they want is to be treated like adults, which yeah. means being given really interesting problems and then being given the autonomy to solve them. Yeah, man, I, I, you took a real... There was a narrow path that you could have taken in that conversation of how to, you almost led the person, it sounds like, to like, you know, make the right decision. But I'm not saying, hell no, you're here nine to six. You know what I'm saying? Like that's- yeah, like, well, for, Netflix is famous for this culture thing, but uh, do, do you know what Netflix's vacation policy is? No. They don't have one. Yeah. You know what, they, what their travel policy is? They don't have one. You know what their expense policy is? They don't have one. Yeah. They don't have any policies, almost none. It's because they're trying to hire adults yeah. who have good judgment. Because think about this. Let's say you're, you're out, you're recruiting, yeah. and you go, I need some guy to manage all my uh, manufacturing. And he's going to be in charge of 30 million, whatever the number is, worth of product. Yeah. But I don't really trust him to make a good judgment about when it's okay to fly business class and when it's coach. Yeah. When it, when, what the? Yeah. And so... You go, no. And so what happens is you build these guardrails to prevent people with bad judgment from making bad judgments, yep. but you just completely annoy the people who have good judgment. Yeah. It's, so yeah. shift it around and build a system designed for people with good judgment, and then they love it. Yeah. Because they go, oh, I'm trusted. Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not having to go, oh, crap, I got to sit down and do an expense report. Yeah. It's so true. It's so. I just interviewed a couple weeks ago uh, uh, Dana White from the UFC, and he they do the same thing at the UFC. Yeah, and I was just saying, man, I, it sounds so right, and everything about it, I know it's right. It's really hard, but it's really hard. I've always, you know, we've also always had like a we've had a young staff, and we've just always ran it like, hey, we have forty people, and so it's right at that edge where you can still kind of hands on see if everyone's at their computer or not. But as you start start to grow and get smarter and get better, but who cares about the computer? Yeah. If you set the goals about what they're supposed to accomplish, you can measure that much more easily. Yeah. Big time. Um, and the, your the, their peers will notice it. And it's not just an executive. You can. We, I I also I, in that will never work. I'll talk about the, a receptionist. Yeah. And you could say your job is to be at the desk from eight in the morning until six o'clock at night, and you get one hour off, and you have two weeks of vacation, or and you don't eat at your desk. Yep. Or you can say, your job is to put the best face forward for this company. Yeah. Figure out the best way to do that. Yeah. And that person begins figuring out what hours they have to be there. And they figure out how to cover for themselves when they're sick or have a, a doctor's appointment. And they make the judgment that it's probably not a good idea to be sitting there eating a piece of pizza at their desk when yeah. somebody walks in. And it might be a good idea to have candy in the bowl. Yeah. But 
Yeah, and they yeah. feel empowered uh, because you've trusted them and been clear. But it also means that if you make a bad hire and the person does not have the judgment yeah. and you sit down with them and go, um, you know, Josh, um, what do you think about when you come in dressed like that? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I didn't think about that. It's the wrong person for that job. Yeah. And you got to catch that quick, right? No, you just need to catch it and you need to make the call. Yep. And most people go, he's doing fine. He hasn't stolen anything and yeah. he's not coming in drunk. That's not the point. He's not achieving the objective you wanted. He's not an excellent player. Yeah. And this is it's easy. Receptious is one. It scales all the way up. Yeah. The, the other thing, yeah. <laughs> now I'll get started on culture stuff. Please. But um, uh, when you recognize you have someone who's not working out, yep. The worst possible thing is I don't, I don't, some you from, oh yeah, it, performance improvement plan or something like that, okay. where you go, ah, oh, I know I have to fire this person, and they know they're fucking up and yeah. they're going to get fired. But instead, you do the kabuki theater, yep. where you sit them down and go, I'm going to put together a list of objectives for you for the next six months, and we'll meet and, t yeah, purely so that you can cover your ass about how you've proven that they're yeah. lame and yeah. can fire them. Yeah, and. It's so cruel. Yep. You know it, they know it. Just sit them down and go, listen, you, you know it's not working out. Yeah. Yeah. And it, so, I mean, again, companies like Netflix, which we did that when we had, you know, 100, they did have 7,000 and they still do it. Yeah. Really hard. But, and it's taken them a long, long time to build the systems and processes. But it's this attitude that as long that that's what you want. And you get great people yep. who, are, who can. <laughs> pivot yeah, you know yeah gosh. all that stuff anyway that's cool uh, yeah that's cool that's my next step as a as a you know as a leader as a leader it's the uh, it's the job and uh, yeah I love it what's um, when it comes to working with all these new startups and all these founders and is there anything that kind of sticks out to you as either like almost an instant deal breaker like you're never going to make it or an instant like, gosh, this person is a star. Even if it's not this business, this person is an absolute star. No, I mean, I, I, you can't tell. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason you have to be willing to acknowledge your mistakes. Yep. It's not, you're not saying, is the person a screw up? Yep. It's, did I make a mistake? Did I spec the job wrong? Yep. Or what usually happens, did the job change? Yep. Netflix, for example, but when it did streaming, initially built its own infrastructure. Yeah. And so it hired the smartest people in the world at building server infrastructure to serve movies. Yeah. Yeah. And then not long after that, Amazon Web Services came along and we realized that could be a much better way to do this yeah. and shifted it there. And all these people who are amazingly good, yeah. they're brilliant, yeah. but we don't need them anymore. Yeah, yeah. And to keep them in some other job, it, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, big time. Or so the, 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 you, you, the reality is, no matter how you can interview well, and there's a lot of tricks we could talk about for that in a whole different podcast. Yeah, yeah. But um, you're going to make mistakes. You can't tell. Yeah. You just got to be willing to acknowledge your mistakes and own that it wasn't the person. Yeah. It was you. Yeah. And that you have to be fair to someone. You can't just, you know, yeah. put them out in the street. And is that the same lesson when you're dealing with founders? If you're investing or you're bringing someone in as a founder, is there any qualities in a founder that are the magic ones or is it the same idea? That you, you only know it when you see it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's you only know it when you see yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and again, a lot of it is, you, it, it, yeah, it, that's a much harder one. I don't know how to, ju I don't know how to judge that. Yeah. I've realized I can't tell anymore. Yeah. Because uh, no one knows anything. I can't yeah. tell a good idea from you a bad your, idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, the stuff I like doing is so early that I can't possibly handicap whether it'll be successful or not. So now I have a totally different one, which is do I like the person? Yeah. Do I want to see this person have a shot at the same sort of things that I had a shot at? Yeah. And if so, I'll work with them or I'll back them. Or and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, doesn't. But at least I got a chance to sit and have a really great front row seat for a great yeah. ride. That's awesome. What would you say, you know, you're, in my mind, you're an expert at kind of the mission statement, right? We talked about it with Netflix. <laughs> you, even the way you described, like, your job for the secretary is to put your best face uh, first for this company. Like, yeah. you're very good at that. What is the, what's the goal with, the, with this book and with your speaking and with your advising? Like, what's kind of the goal there? 
Oh, it's an, it's absolutely to empower people to um, take a shot. Yep. Um, and and that and it 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 didn't it came to me late, fairly late. I didn't make the connection that all the skills that I had built up over forty years as an entrepreneur yep. were not just skills that people could use to start companies, yep. but that everyone gets that advice, like you know, follow your dreams. Follow your dreams, Chris. Yeah. But no one ever goes, and then sign you up for Follow Your Dreams 101 yeah. with all the, and so, but I realized that all these same things that are going into getting a company started, yeah. which is figure out quick and easy ways to test things, scale your aspirations to your abilities, yeah. just do something, are the same whether you want to start a club or whether you want to try and get a promotion or whether you want to do some innovation in your department or yeah. That there, the, or you want to go back to your village um, yeah. in Afghanistan and try and reforest the block. Yeah. I mean, they're the same. Yeah, and that is what my speaking is about, and that is what um, my mentoring is about, and that is what that will never work is about. It's giving people the confidence um, and the skills to uh, to do it. And in, in that will never works case, it's not a a you book. You should do this or you should do that. It's a me book. Yeah. But people will see, and I explain how I made decisions or what I was thinking and feeling, yeah. and they'll see how these things are actually put into practice. And I hope that they read this and they can apply these things to whatever their dream is. Yeah, huge. Okay, here's my two enders. Number one, if you could jump in a time machine and go anywhere in your own life and tell yourself anything, where would you go and what would you say? <laughs> I'd probably go back to November 1998. Okay. And I would say, Mark, there's this company about to launch called Google. Mm -hmm. I want you to buy as much of that stock <laughs> yes. as you can. Yes. I know it's going to sound like a stupid idea. Yeah. Buy that stock. I like that. I like that. <laughs> Good practical advice. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> um, and what about, here's my last one. What, if you could prescribe anything to the entire world for 30 days and they have to do it, what do you make everyone do? <laughs> uh, my knee-jerk reaction is put the fucking phone away. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I think I'll save that. To, I'll let uh, Desmond Tutu or someone like that take <laughs> take on that one. Yep. Um. You know, I would encourage people to, let's call this, get, get that idea out of your head month. Yep. Take yep. that thing that you've been chewing on for your whole life and let's, we're all going to take the chance this this month and, yeah. and try that thing. Yep. Big, small, ambitious, not ambitious. Yep. Let's, let's just find, let's just learn something. Yeah, that's it. Listen, man, thank you so much. This was incredible. We, we covered a little bit of everything. We got advice. We got a good story. We got input on I can't thank you enough. Um, well, people say that that will never work sounds just like me. Mm -hmm. So if you, want, <laughs> yes. if you want the long form version, uh, there it is. And it's out September 19th, right? 17th, yeah. 17th and everywhere where books are. Oh, I'm guessing, as right? they say, everywhere that books are sold. There we go. And I, we'll put all the links and everything. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, we'll put this out right around that time. Uh, we'll put everything in the bio. So if anyone's looking, it's in the description. Uh, and just thank you. My pleasure. So I, and I, you're, you're, you're going to take me down to show yes, me I'm the- Yes, I'm going to show uh, you around. Because I want to geek out on- uh, It'll be just like the old startup. Days. Yeah, startup film. <laughs> yes. <All right. laughs> thank you. Guys, if you like that and you want to see more like it as well as vlogs, other web series, and all the random stuff that I'm doing here on YouTube, don't forget to click that subscribe button. You won't regret it. I promise.